today's webinar is on facts and myths about RDoC. My name is Uma, and I'm the Scientific Program Manager for the RDoC unit here at NIMH. And in today's webinar, I'll be covering many frequently asked questions and concerns about RDoC. RDoC has been around since 2009, and there have been several articles published about it and talks given on it by both folks from within NIMH and outside. However, there still do appear to be a few questions and misconceptions about it. And this webinar is sort of our active effort to um, address that. So with me today are Bruce Cuthbert and Sarah Morris to provide NIMH's perspective on RDoC, and we also have four distinguished panelists from various research institutions who will talk about their experience with RDoC as well. So I'll let everyone introduce themselves, starting off with Bruce first, and then we can go around a circle. So Bruce? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bruce Cuthbert. Uh, I've been the head of the RDoC unit since its inception last October. Uh, as of this November 1st, I will be taking over as the acting director of NIMH following Tom Insel's departure for uh, Google slash Alphabet. Uh, as a result, I'm pleased to introduce our new acting head of the RDoC unit, Dr. Sarah Morris. Dr. Morris has been with us since 2010 and has been very active in all aspects of the RDoC workshops. Uh, authoring many RDoC papers and participating in, in all the activities of our working group. So she is uh, very well suited to take this on and I appreciate Sarah uh, taking over as acting head of the unit in addition to her regular program duties in our schizophrenia portfolio. So Sarah, I'm turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sarah Morris. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the panelists for helping out with this effort uh, and to everyone who's dialing in. We welcome your questions and hope that you find it to be useful. Dr. Gottlieb. Hi, I'm Ian Gottlieb. I'm in the psychology department at Stanford. We um, have been studying depression for a long time and more recently we've been uh, studying RDoC constructs, um, particularly in children. So I'm excited to be part of this. Thanks for inviting me. Brandon? Hi, I'm Brandon Gibb from Binghamton University at SUNY. Um, we study um, depression and anxiety in kids, adolescents, and adults, and focus on cognition, um, genetics, and environment. Thank you. John? I'm Joan Kaufman from the Center of Child and Family Traumatic Stress at Kennedy Krieger Institute, also Johns Hopkins, formerly from Yale, as of 42 days ago. Um, and we have two RDoC grants. One is looking at risk and resilience in maltreated children, which combines measures of gene, environment, um, as well as imaging. And we also have a case ed's bridge project, which is designed to create a tool that will ultimately bridge DSM-5 and RDoC diagnostic perspectives. Uh, Vilma Gabay uh, from Mount Sinai and Nathan Klein Institute in New York. And we have an RDoC project where we're looking at uh, the reward processes in adolescents across all psychiatric conditions. And we've looked to links to activation of the immune system, both in the periphery and in the brain. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, to our viewing audience, again, we apologize for the delay in the start. We welcome your questions as well during the webinar, like Sarah said. If you move your mouse over the Zoom window, you'll see a button that says questions and answers. And if you click on that, it'll open a chat window where you can type in your question and answer to us. And we'll do our best to address them during the webinar today. If not, we'll try to get a hold of you later after the webinar. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so we'll start off with the elephant in the room question, which is that RDoC has been criticized for being reductionistic and focused only on neural circuits at the expense of psychological phenomena. Uh, Sarah and Bruce, would you like to address that first? Sarah, go ahead. Sure. Um, so while it's true that RDoC does have its foundations in a modern understanding of brain behavior relationships, um, we're not um, only interested in neuroscience or circuit-based measures, but all methodologies or units of analysis as we refer to them, including self-report questionnaires, data from EEG, genetics, behavior are equally important and they inform and constrain each other in an integrative way. So in a sense, it's a pluralistic system in which different types of measuring and getting at constructs are, are meant to be integrated. Uh, what has been our panelists' experience with their grants? Do you feel similar? Do you feel anything different? We're, uh, I mean, speaking for myself, we're certainly studying neural circuitry, but in addition, and I think it's a, a real strength of our doc, we're also um, studying a range of other, as Sarah mentioned, units of analysis where we're 
examining telomere length, we're examining um, cortisol secretion, we're looking at self-report questionnaires. So um, I don't think we would have done nearly as well or gotten the information that we needed if we had restricted our study to neural circuits. that I don't think we can think about neurocircuitry without speak, speak, thinking about psychology and experiences. We're learning more and more about neuroplasticity. Um, you know, and in our studies, we're finding, you know, dimensional measures of trauma predict individual differences in connectivity within the brain, and that, you know, the effect of trauma can be moderate, moderated by social supports. So I think needing to embrace kind of the dynamic interaction of all these things, nothing, you know, none of these systems work in isolation. And I think the RDOC's goal is to really think about how to integrate across units of analysis and recognize they're in dynamic interaction. Brandon, do you want anything to that? Um, so in our study, we're not looking at imaging at all. And I, I think what, what helped us get our initial grant was probably the, um, the really explicit focus on looking across units of analysis. So looking at um, you know, EEG and eye tracking, for example, or looking at physiology and, and self-report. And, and I think the, the bigger key is looking across units of analysis and trying to integrate it across those instead of any one being um, foundational or, or all encompassing. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, referring to what uh, Joanna kind of mentioned in her question, I think the next sort of uh, myth, if you will, about RDOC is that RDOC ignores developmental and environmental factors uh, and that it focuses only on neural circuits. And since Joan already had an answer to that, I'll kind of let her, you know, go with that first. If that's okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think you know, at, as we're learning more and more about how the brain functions and develops, you know, the brain is not a static organ and that it's very dynamic, influenced by development um, as well as by experience. So incorporating development experience into um, studies that are looking at kind of more basic neuroscience outcomes is absolutely key, both from a translational perspective as well as in clinical studies. Yeah, I, I'd want to echo that. In fact, our our study is explicitly developmental, longitudinal through puberty. So, and it's an RDOC study. Uh, I just think it's not the case that RDOC is ignoring developmental issues. Okay. So, Sarah, how would you answer the question then that there is nothing explicitly about environmental development in the RDOC matrix? Well, part of it, I I think that misconception comes from a practical. Uh, fact, which is that it's very hard to depict four-dimensional space uh, in a slide or in a journal article. So we end up showing our, our, our matrix with its rows and columns, but it's hard to depict what we really imagine to be a, in a way, a separate dimension within each every, when it, within every cell in the matrix, which is the relationship of, uh, of environment and of development, um, in a sense, in every single cell in the matrix. But RDOC is focused on individual measurements that are done at the individual level. And so I guess the, those factors of environment and development are, are measured in the way that they impact individuals and can be uh, detected in individuals. Okay. Does anyone else have anything to contribute to that, Vilmar Brandon? I mean, from our, our study also, you know, we focus on adolescents. Many of the psychiatric conditions start during this vulnerable period of time. Uh, there are multiple symptoms which we don't know what they mean. Uh, are they going to become chronic? Uh, is the kid is going to be just fine uh, and the normal with no psychiatric condition an adult? So, uh, you know, looking, for example, at adolescents, would allow us to come with preventive and early on biomarkers. So that's as developmental as can be uh, in an RDOC study. Yep, true. All right, so to reiterate then, it sounds like, uh, you know, quite, you know, several of you do have grants that obviously focus on the developmental aspects of RDOC, environmental aspects as well. And would you say it's sort of been um, freeing to not have it specify in the matrix because it allows you to study it in a way that you'd like, right? If I'm correct, based on your replies. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that it, there's a, um, even in the original writings, there was a, a huge section about development and environment. So it's always um, kind of surprised me that people, um, you know, either missed it or didn't see that the emphasis from the beginning. Um, okay. 
So I think it's always it's always been there, um, you know, as it should for all of these disorders. It's interesting to think about anything being freeing when you're writing a grant. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's tough to to put these constructs, especially early on in our doc. Um, you know, Bruce and I have had lots of conversations about what's an outcome. And it's really difficult to, to try to understand exactly what we're doing, but I'm just assuming that this is RDoc 1.0 and that we're going to be having changes um, to RDoc given findings from these studies um, down the road. But I think in, in the sense of going beyond a DSM diagnosis, that, that was just a, a nice thing to be able to do in a grant. Changed recruitment, for example, tremendously. So um, you also bring up an important point, Ian. Um, in your grant, how did you define outcome variables? That's a question we get often. How do you define outcome variables in RDoc applications? Yeah, it's a, I think it's a really difficult thing to do um, without relying on, I mean, you could say anxiety symptoms or depressive symptoms. We're actually much more interested in our work on the impact of early stress on neural trajectories of boys and girls through puberty. So we sidestep the issue of outcome explicitly until we start putting in follow-up um, applications for this. But I think it, it is really difficult. You wanna say, does it lead to depression? Does it lead to anxiety? But without being uh, um, constrained by the diagnostic criteria. Uh, what about any of you, Brandon, Joan, or Vilma? What we are doing in our study, uh, you know, we're looking at a different level of activation of the immune system under stress, under psychological stress, under biological stress. And then our outcome is how our brain may, may respond to different level of reward, um, as well as clinical phenomenology of symptoms. So getting it out of the categorical diagnosis. And, and the truth is, it's our, especially in adolescents, the clinical categories of diagnosis are really a mess these days. I mean, we, many of them change. You don't really know what you treat. So our outcome are really leveled on the neurocircuitry, on chemicals in the brain, and on our, the clinical symptoms. Interesting. And I think for us, it's likewise, looking at kind of multiple um, neural measures as well as dimensional measures of a range of different clinical symptoms, recognizing a comorbidity is the rule. So we're not just interested in one like depression, but we also know that kids with a history of abuse are at increased risk for substance use. So really looking across multiple types of outcomes dimensionally and ideally wanting, you know, working to link it to various brain systems. Um, Sarah, any perspectives on the program side on how people should define outcomes? Um, I think we've heard some really great examples here uh, and just kept capturing that basic idea that we will get more traction by not wetting ourselves to um, complex heterogeneous diagnostic categories, whether we're talking about um, understanding existing illness or pre predicting and preventing illness which leads us right nicely into our next question, which is that, is RDoc intended to replace the current DSM-5 diagnostic system? Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> so um, this is Bruce, and since unfortunately I have to run off to another meeting in a minute, I'll put in my two cents here. Um, I'll pick up on what Ian said about this being RDoc 1.0, and that's exactly right. RDoc is a framework that is intended to grow and change dynamically and continually as new research data come out. And so uh, the whole idea is to create a burgeoning literature that it can inform how we might uh, create new revisions of the DSM and the ICD in the future. But there is no anticipation that we will release any kind of competing document in that sense. In fact, we'll never really release our doc, which implies some cohesive finished product. Rather, uh, the result is just a continual uh, expansion and we hope an increasing sophistication of the research literature that could tell us in the future how we ought to make a, a diagnostic system that works uh, in terms of being informed by neurodevelopment, brain circuits, behavior, and indeed people's lived experience of what it's like 
uh, either to have these disorders or even to be in a risk state for these disorders, which of course can lead us to prevention. Um, I guess the next question comes directly from what you just said, Bruce. If RDoC is meant to evolve, you know, people have criticized by saying, well, you're putting a lot of these constructs and specified them in the matrix. So essentially you've just replaced one set of categories in the DS and the new set of constructs. Uh, what if I want to study a new construct? In fact, we've had questions coming in right now that effect. What if I want to study a construct that's not there in the matrix? You know, so I can't use RDoC. How would I go about doing that? Um, that's actually one of the real misperceptions, again, that it's the idea that, well, this is what's out there, so that's all you're allowed to do. In fact, our current constructs have been vetted by work groups as having a lot of promise and validity for study, but explicitly we also say these constructs re represent exemplars of how you might go about creating constructs that cut across the units of analysis and probably cut across many of our current diagnostic groupings. So we explicitly encourage the study of new constructs. Uh, the investigator simply needs to provide information in the grant application indicating the literature to date that would suggest that this would be a viable new construct uh, and propose how they would go about studying it and instantiating it. Uh, and the only way that the RDoC matrix can in fact grow as intended is if in fact people do submit applications to study new constructs and propose them. So uh, far from uh, not having that available, that is very much explicitly encouraged. And it's always a good idea to talk to program staff here at NIMH about how to put together an application like that and to you know, lay the scientific basis for uh, proposing a new construct in an application. Sarah, do you have anything to add from a programmatic well, point of view? Yeah, I think maybe perhaps one source of the confusion has been the difference between our RDoC RFAs that we have published for um, to invite R01 applications. And in those um, RFAs, we did explicitly say that the uh, proposal needed to involve one of the defined RDoC constructs. And the reason behind that was simply that we felt it was important to have an initial critical mass of applications looking at uh, of projects that looked at those um, constructs that we thought were likely to be useful. Um, but at, outside of those specific RFAs, investigators are welcome to submit investigator-initiated applications that propose all other constructs. So I think it would be interesting to hear from our panelists about whether you feel that you introduced a new construct or sort of a new take on a current construct in your work or whether you've thought about that. It would be well, I, if I can do this quickly, um, I think a perfect example, I have a postdoc who just got an NRSA to look at irritability as a construct in this sample. And Ellen Liebenloft is a, is a consultant on that project, but it's basically integrating irritability into the, study of threat, acute response, uh, response to acute stress, to prolonged stress. So I think that there are different kinds of mechanisms available to start to introduce constructs that weren't, aren't in our doc to start with, um, to see what they do with the other constructs. Uh, Brandon, Joan, or Vilma, how about your grants? Have you tried introducing constructs that are not there in the matrix, or have you stuck with them mostly? We are also looking at irritability, which is uh, another core feature in, in adolescence, uh, which uh, may induce multiple related uh, symptoms, including threat, fear, uh, uh, and affect reward. So it, it's part of our matrix, even though it's not, you know, as part of the grant, but it is included in all our investigation. And we did also look at relationship to white matter, we, uh, you know, compared to other symptom dimensions, and uh, it does seem like it's associated with a distinct uh, neurocircuitry, which makes sense, and probably different neurobiology. And I think, you know, the complexity of these issues, we're not even at the beginning of understanding, because we know, you know, irritability, when it's chronic, seems to have a different biology than when it's episodic. Um, you know, and, you know, irritability is totally non-diagnostic specific. You can have it with anxiety, you can have it with depression, you can have it with bipolar. So, um, you know, how we assess even these dimensions kind of over time and care, because 
there's probably something very meaningful in, in these clinical dimensions from a longitudinal perspective, which I think, you know, we're all in the infancy and how do we relate that to what we know and understand about neural circuitry and risk and all those sorts of things. So. I'll, um, I'll add something. So ours was, um, um, we submitted our grant at the, the first call, the first R of A, and what we did that I think might have been um, helpful was instead of proposing a new construct, we said this construct, you know, this thing that we're looking at seems to occur across a couple different constructs. And so we're going to try to compare and contrast between these constructs to get a, a little bit more clarity. And, um, and, and that's another thing that I think is, is probably interesting within RDoc is comparing across constructs or across systems. And across units. Right, right. Yeah, so it sounds like what's more important to derive from the matrix are the ideas behind RDoc rather than the constructs themselves, which is that there, these are dimensional constructs, you had to measure a range, and that these constructs are based on both biology and behavior. Would you say that's fair? Yes. And highly interrelated. So they're not like, they may be under different columns, mm -hmm. but the idea that they're totally distinct and separate I think doesn't, um, you know, is not what RDoc is trying to say. Yeah. All right. Um, a related question to this just come up often is that RDoc does not define impairment. There's no way of knowing what is normal or abnormal on a construct, you know, whereas in the DSM, at least you have a cutoff for a certain disorder. Um, so anyone want to tackle that question? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can answer it and I'm sure others would answer it too. I think that the the categ I think that the binary inclusion of of our DSM is really artificial because we really now don't know when impairment starts and when it ends. Uh, our non NOS syndrome are not significant clinically. Of course they are. Uh, so I think what at least in our study, what we are trying to measure is when impairment starts when the reward, when reward processes or reward circuitry or fear gets to the point where it's impairment. The goal would be, I, I hope that, you know, with, with, uh, with technologies like with Google and Apple, we'll be able to come with a, with a specific items which make us abnormal and then we need to seek treatment. And I think that's where that the goal so i think that would be the future to do come with with levels which are within normal range and without normal range and i think just to add to that i mean i think that's part of the goal in creating this database and i think just like with hypertension where you have a subclinical range of functioning where you're not really sick but it would say, aha, some sort of change in lifestyle, change in behavior or medicine might be indicated so that you don't get into the pathological range. And I think ultimately the goal is to be able to correct, collect this sort of data to understand where the cutoffs for you know, absolute treatment are or where the cutoffs for prevention might be. Um, you know, and what things in recognizing it may not just be medicine, it may be change in lifestyle, change in environment. So. The, the other piece of that is also um, explicitly testing for nonlinear effects, you know, so seeing is there a, a threshold effect at which point something becomes impairing, um, which I think RDoC is, is very well set up for. Yep. But it does raise the importance of those outcome measures. Yeah. Right, and impairment as one, as a just general impairment and a kind of GAF since yeah yeah right, sir anything else to add to that from the well just to elaborate i think uh brandon's point about looking for tipping points or natural discontinuities is a very important one because if we um conduct research uh with this false dichotomization of individuals into patient group and control group we would miss all that um so it's not that um our doc uh, that one can't do uh, between group analyses in an RDoc project, but that those groups should be defined um, on, the, on the basis of your uh, empirical findings. All right, so now I think I'm gonna transition a little bit more into uh, questions related more specific to sort of grant applications. Till now we're to attack a little bit more broader conceptual issues. 
So this is one that we get often, which is that in order to get NIMH funding, your proposal must include RDOC in it. Is that true, Sarah? That is not true. Um, at this time, most of the clinical research grants that NIMH funds are actually not um, incorporating uh, RDOC principles. Um, of course, uh, we hope that that will change and that um, as uh, researchers and reviewers become more familiar and persuaded by the logic behind RDOC, that they will um, adopt some of those principles of dimensionality and multiple units of analysis. Um, but at this point, there's no uh, policy or change to the review criteria um, from NIMH's perspective uh, that would have the effect of only funding RDOC grants. And I assume our panelists can vouch for that, that they have non RDOC grants that have. That we are have not RDOC grants. Okay, good to hear. Um, you too. <laughs> um, related to that, um, the next you know sort of issue that's come up is that a lot of uh, people ask us, do you have to have a neuroimaging measure to get an RDOC grant, or how many units need to be included, which is another version of it, units of analysis. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, why don't you lead off on that, and then we'll let the other people. Yeah, sure. So um, although RDOC constructs are based on brain circuits and an understanding of brain behavior relationships, it's not necessary for every RDOC study to include neuroimaging measures. The general principles are that we get better validity in our measurement by using converging different methods, and that we should be open to indicators of dysfunction that aren't just symptom-based. So for example, if we wait for um, a symptom to be available to self-report, we may have missed an opportunity for intervention earlier on. So again, that idea that, um, that multiple measures lend better validity and that other indicators of dysfunction other than self-report, but they don't have to be brain uh, measures, might be more predictive or objective. Um, for our panelists, do you, um, are most of your grants more biased towards brain measures, you think, or an equal mix of brain, self-report, and other measures? I think I might be the only panelist that has no imaging in the, in the grant at all. Um, and so, I mean, so, I mean, I think that um, what we did do, though, is recognize that the, the constructs were chosen because they have a, um, a, an assumed underlying neural circuit. And we based our argument around that and said, we're going to work at um, each of the other units of analysis. And so we're still going to try to converge and, and work toward this um, kind of integrative view of the construct. But um, um, we weren't criticized at all in our grants for, for not having imaging and no one brought it up. But to be fair, you're, you are doing EEG. Yes. Right. So, I mean, it is a measure of brain. Yeah. I think brain function. Yeah. yeah. Right. Just yeah. a different measure. And so I, I think it is a reasonable question to ask whether you, you need some measure of brain function. I know that there are RDOC grants without any. Um, they're probably not the rule. And, you know, Sarah would have a much better sense of this than, than we would from this side of it. I would guess it's on the integration of ideas and ultimately the research question so that it's not one measure that says this is fundable, this is not fundable. It's, you know, what's your pilot data? What's innovative that you're bringing? How can this move the field forward? Um, so, you know, I, th I think that's really where people need to be kind of evaluating and, and looking at that. That's a very good way to phrase it. Yep. Um, related to this, we just got a question that asked, do you have any recommendations for looking at some of the more biological dimensions when you may not have the resources to analyze these? Is the best way to collaborate with those that do or are there other ways? Have any of you had this experience where you want to recruit more or less and you didn't have the resources to do so in terms of RDOC studies? Collaborate. Hmm? How we've done it is collaborate, you know, so we have, um, you know, the, the team's large and everybody has their, their expertise. And so there's a you know, genetics expert, there's a physiology expert, there's a um, um, ERP expert. Um, I think that's the, the only real way to do this. Yeah, I don't know that this was intended as a, a consequence of RDOC, but I think the multiple units of analysis on these grants has just created collaborations um, for most of these grants that probably wouldn't have been created had it not been um, 
that it needed to be an RDoC application. Yeah, I agree. I remember when I put the application, I looked at the key personnel and I said, oh my God, I have so many key personnel, but you know, that's the consequence of a multi-analysis RDoC application. And I think that's the only way to really move the field forward. We're, we, it's, the brain is so complicated, our body is so complicated, and put it, it all together, we have to get uh, uh, applications from cancer, from genetics, from imaging, from chemistry, and that's the future. Any other insights to add to that from anyone else? No? All right, we'll move on to our next question. One of our viewers asks, all of this information pertains to what NIMH would like to see, but it is reviewers who decide whether something should be funded. How confident are you that reviewers take the same positions as your panel? Can I answer that? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true that reviewers play an important role in the process of getting grants funded but they don't make funding decisions. So, but I can say that we are um, actively reaching out to uh, reviewers who serve on panels at CSR to educate them about RDoC and about NIMH's interest in uh, projects that accept, that um, adopt RDoC principles so that they know uh, perhaps how better to think about them when they come their way uh, in standing review sections. So we get an kind of equal number of complaints about um, that 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 our doc applications get bad scores at CSR, and then the versus the idea that you can't get funded if you don't do an R doc grant. And so we're looking at that really carefully, um, and we have been doing some analyses about differential scoring, and we're not finding strong patterns of differential scoring and funding uh, based on whether a grant invokes R doc or not. So we are keeping an eye out for that and doing everything we can to make sure that reviewers are educated about NIMH's priorities and interest in these applications. All right. uh, the next question we've gotten is, are RDoC grants for human clinical perspectives only? Can you speak to other RDoC dimensions, perspectives, and grants can be applied to non-human basic science perspectives? And this is, again, one of Sarah's, not to shut our panelists <laughs> out, but. <laughs> So absolutely, and that, I mean, there's a really nice paper written by Ari Kaufman and John Crystal talking about taking the RDoC perspective and bringing it into animal models. We've been trying to model psychiatric disorders based on these complex heterogeneous things that don't exist in animals and that taking the RDoC perspective and a brain circuitry perspective into the animal work is key. And it can be extremely synergistic. There's things you can do in animals that you can't do in kids. So if I see a methylation change and I really want to understand what's the mechanism leading to that epigenetic change, I can't do the molecular studies in kids, but I can collaborate with someone who works in mice and can do that. And so um, absolutely, RDoC translates perfectly and it's Kaufman, K-A-F-F-M-A-N, Ari Kaufman. It's a great paper thinking about how to bring RDoC perspectives into animal models of mental illness. I, I would be even stronger. I was on the negative valence work group and there were 40 of us, half of whom were animal researchers. And my perspective, which I know is wrong, is that almost all of the negative valence system con domain um, was created by the animal researchers. And I think it's perfect for them. I mean, you just look at those constructs of sustained threat and acute fear, and um, it's just made for it's just made for animal researchers. So I think it's it's sometimes tougher for people doing human research to fit these constructs in um, in a in a valid, creative way. Sorry, that was too strong. No, we, we like. This but I think it's I think it's important. I think that um, it's. It's not, can animal researchers play a role? I think that they played a tremendous role in creating the matrix. And refining it. And refining it. That too, yeah. All right, another question we've gotten is, um, can you comment on whether using an RDoC perspective would be useful in pursuing one of the R21, R33 grants? I think, um, Sarah, wanna take that one again? Yeah, sure. So that's one of our new um, uh, clinical trials, RFAs. Um, so to uh, determine the um, efficacy of novel treatments. 
And I believe that there is language in that um, RFA about RDOC, and we certainly encourage uh, applicants to take, to adopt RDOC principles as they're thinking about those treatments. Um, and that would take the, sh the form of not, um, not conceptualizing the work in terms of developing a treatment for a heterogeneous categorical disorder, but perhaps focusing on um, a, a more RDOC, either a defined RDOC construct or a, uh, a similar disorder independent uh, construct. Um, a related question we've gotten to that, Sarah, and I think the others can help answer this one too, is that um, when your grant funding uh, budget is essentially limited and RDOC requires that you recruit patients from every diagnostic group, how do you sort of go about doing this? Do you take all comers? You know, how do you, how do you deal with the recruitment criteria? Right, so I can get started and then our panelists uh, have lived experience in this. So um, just to be clear, the, the basic principle is that you would not uh, recruit or frame your hypotheses on the basis of a DSM category. Uh, your recruitment would be guided by your hypotheses and the goal of um, uh, ending up with a, with a participant group that has, that has the full dimension of the construct that you're interested in studying. And so that might mean that you uh, target your recruitment to one sort of group of DSM disorders or um, you could achieve dimensionality by looking across disorders or by looking at um, subsyndromal symptoms um, and achieve that dimensionality from the clinical population into the general population. So you really have to be guided by the hypotheses, but the hypotheses in the essence should not be about treating or testing the validity of a DSM disorder. <laughs> Yeah, if I may, um, Lee Williams, who's a colleague of mine here at Stanford, is has an RDOC grant in which she is taking all comers to a treatment clinic, for example. So that's one way of um, getting a range of um, scores or functioning along whatever dimension you happen to be looking at. Uh, because we're looking at stress in kids, we um, our best friend is Craigslist, and we're recruiting, we're taking all comers, but with ads um eliciting kids who have experienced stress i mean through their parents of course but um trying to get a higher range of um stressful experiences but it's been as we were saying earlier freeing not to have to fill cells of um mdd or bipolar to get your um the numbers just right ours is also all comers so we're taking all seven to eleven year olds um, who can complete the protocol yeah in, in our case, we're looking at, uh, looking at Tanner stage, which is uh, three, four, and five, uh, puberty, but of course, psychiatric condition, as long as they can participate in the study, uh, with, uh, are, we, with the aim to get the full range of the specific symptoms. So for example, full range of anhedonia from zero to full scale, uh, same with pleasure, same with hopelessness. So, uh, our outcome, or at least inclusionary, is for the whole group to have a full range of this of the dimension that we're looking into. And we're looking at stress-related mechanisms associated with psychopathology, and so our inclusion criteria are really looking at kids at the extreme. So kids who had a recent out-of-home placement due to severe abuse, then looking at ranges of psychopathology they experience, and looking at comparison children who've not had that intrafamilial type of trauma. Um, so, and that's one of the ways in which I think I, I think Sarah's point initially is the hypotheses should drive the inclusion criteria. But in, in general, it sounds like it's actually been easier for folks to recruit uh, rather than the other way around. And there's concern that uh, if you had to recruit too broad a spectrum, whatever, it, like you said, based on your hypotheses, it's actually been easier to take all comers rather than restrict them by diagnoses or whatever. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, good. Um, we have a couple of sort of repeat questions, but I figured since people are logging in uh, late, I just want to go over them quickly if you can address them again. Uh, someone asked for the Kaufman citation again. So can you go over that quickly, John? So it's Ari Kaufman, K-A-F-F-M-A-N, together with John Crystal. I think it's 2014. I don't have the, you know, 
I can't I pull it up on my computer, but it's Ari Kaufman. It will come up on PubMed. Um, and, you know, it's specifically about RDoC perspectives in animal research. So a very well written paper. Um, another question asks, I understand that a brain measure is not necessarily required to get an RDoC grant, but is a biomarker of some sort required, however, though? I think we covered this earlier, but can you just sort of go over it quickly? I guess my short answer would be that um, you would want to think very carefully about a biomarker for what. Mm -hmm. um, we have not had much luck identifying biomarkers for DSM disorders, and that's part of the motivation behind RDoC. Um, and also, again, to think in terms of um, the principles of RDoC, it is possible to do an RDoC-informed project um, using only self-report or behavioral measures. Uh, again, incorporating those ideas about dimensionality um, and, and not simply looking at one extreme of a disorder. All right. And a related question that we got, Sarah, um, is there a place in RDoC for research on parenting or family? This kind of goes back to the development slash environment. So, <laughs> yeah. Later, I just want to make sure we, you know, cover them twice. Yeah, I'll give my short answer and then our panelists, again, have better uh, detailed experience. Um, there, there is certainly uh, an appreciation of the importance of all kinds of different environment and developmental trajectories um, in RDoC. Um, just because they're not articulated in the, in the matrix doesn't mean that we don't know that they're important. Um, so we do encourage investigators to um, to test hypotheses that involve those kinds of factors um, and to measure them at the at the level of the individual. Just to sort of reiterate, I think without a doubt, we know that you know psychopatho risk for psychopathology, brain development is enormously influenced by parenting and varying experience, whether you're looking at animal studies or you're looking at human studies, children born in or raised in institutions. So without a doubt, these questions can be um, ex examined from an RDoC perspective, and it's an important to have, you know, experience as part of the um, measures accounting for variability and outcome. Yeah. And to make it concrete, if it helps, um, uh, Sarah Ordaz in my lab has just got a K award to add parenting to the RDoC project that we have already. So I think that, uh, I mean, Sarah's absolutely right, and they're putting their, thank you, your money where your mouth is. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have about another five minutes left. So I'm going to start getting on to, to the end of our list of questions here. Uh, so one that we've gotten is RDoC is essentially asking the field to wait another 10 years for neuroscience to inform new treatments. You know, how do you how do you deal with that? That's a long time to wait before you do anything with it. How long have we been waiting since Freud? <laughs> <laughs> so you can wait a little bit longer. Yep. <laughs> it's been years. I mean, we, for every treatment to come and uh, when you look at clinical trials, it takes years and years and years. So here we have nothing. We're starting, uh, I think this is our chance to get into specific pathway and biomarkers that can really inform on new treatments. I think 10 years, uh, it's it's very brief period of time. I don't, I don't know who's waiting. Um, I, mean, mm -hmm. I don't see these as as um, conflicting at all. I, mean, I think that this complements the new um, outcome um, trial initiative really well. And, you know, the only um, difference between how it was is um, focus on a key mechanism and show that you're moving that mechanism. But you're still, you know, you're still treating impaired people and you're still studying how to best do that. So I don't see, um, I, don't, I don't know of anybody waiting for 10 years to start doing treatment trials again. It also seems to imply that we've learned nothing at all from DSM, and I don't think that's the case. I mean, I think we've learned a lot, and there are obviously problems with it, but we can take what works, what we know, and build on it, which I think is what RDoc is trying to do. Yeah, I, that's how I think of it, too, that um, not that everything we've learned about DSM disorders is wrong, but that um, if we think of those disorders, those diagnoses, as serving as a proxy variable for something, uh, and we need to do a better job of figuring out what exactly does do those diagnoses reflect and how might they be improved and refined and become more informative by 
testing outside of those boundaries. Which is what the transdiagnostic treatments have, have been starting to do anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. And we are using medication across the same medication across psychiatric conditions. So uh, be able to really specify what we're really treating, uh, which we're doing, but without any real biomarker at these days. Um, and again, we had, we sort of have a little bit of a repeat question again, like I said, you know, since we started late, uh, one person asked, um, how is RDOC being transmitted through NIMH program directors? Some we have talked with seem focused on behavior without knowledge of RDOC principles. Sarah, want to address that again? I'm sorry, did you say through NIMH directors or through program NIMH directors is how the question's phrased. I still didn't hear it. Sorry. Um, how is RDOC being transmitted uh, throughout NIMH program directors? Some oh. have talked with seem focused on behavior without knowledge of RDOC principles. Well, I can only say that um, we certainly have talked about it a lot here on the program and uh, at NIMH and um, certainly having Bruce uh, serve as a division director and now as the acting institute director um, the message does get out, um, but I do think that there is more work to do in making sure that individual program officers um, have a good shared understanding about RDOC um, so that we can be consistent in the guidance that we're giving to applicants. But I hope a webinar like this will help clarify. I would think it would. You guys have all given very frank answers. So we're almost at the end of our time slot here. So before we end, though, I would like to ask our panelists about this. Can you name one thing that uh, following RDOC principles has been very useful, some one unexpected advantage you had in your studies and one perhaps disadvantage? It'd be interesting to hear your perspectives. Um, do you want to start off on that, Ian? Um, sure. So I'm trying to, it's a tough question. I mean, I'm trying to think of, mm -hmm. uh, it's been a big, change from the way that we had done work in our lab to go from diagnosed clinical samples to uh, a recruited sample of, say, kids experiencing stress. And I think um, we're actually learning a lot more about the stress process with this broader group, with a broader perspective than we have been learning um, from a much more circumscribed diagnosed sample. So I think it's, um, you know, again, we're not learning as much about depression as a disorder, but, uh, but we're learning a lot more about a much broader construct for us. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry, Joan, you were saying? Yeah, I think for me, it means embracing the complexity and the ambiguity. Um, and, you know, it's that kind of fine balance of your, you know, you have specific hypotheses, but you also are open to surprises. And I think, um, you know, I think one thing that many people have written about in writing the RDOC is that people are agnostic in what kind of diagnoses are going to look like in 2020 or 2030. And I think um, designing your experiments to have some specific hypotheses, but also be open to surprises because the relationships among these different units of analysis are really complex. Um, and the things we're studying and interested in improving the life trajectory of people with these illnesses is complex. And so it's, you know, it's embracing that complexity. Um, for us, um, it's probably been two big things. One, it's um, encouraging us even more to include as, as many units of analysis as possible in every single study so that we can see where things either line up or break down um, instead of just assuming. And then also, um, like I was mentioning before, um, really testing whether you know the relations you're you're looking at are linear or nonlinear and and really looking for these these you know, break or change points i think for us it was uh, you know when we started to doing some more art we actually started within the categorical diagnosis of our depressed adolescents and we started commuting these anhedonia scores irritability scores both to core symptoms but what we found that both of them as a full range. So you can be very severely depressed, but with no anhedonia, which we know it clinically because adolescents are highly uh, reactive and the same with no irritability and that both of these have full range as if some of them completely overlap with healthy control. Uh, it also allows us to examine which core symptoms may be associated with more severe outcome, uh, either 
in a specific clinical group for a cross psychiatric condition with suicidality, with uh, be more prodromal symptoms. And I just want to uh, repeat what John said. You know, many of what we find is sometimes sound, we do have apophysis, but we have no, cl no clue if we're really going to have our apophysis supported. Uh, one of my colleagues told me it sounds like a fishing exhibition. It's, it's not really. It is in the sense that we don't know what we're really going to find because it's so wide. Okay, well, thank you for your answer. Uh, I think we're slightly past our time now. So thank you everyone again for a fantastic discussion today. Thank you to our viewing audience as well for logging in. And if you weren't able to answer your question during the webinar, we'll do our best to reply to you via email in the coming days. You know, feel free to email us at well, as well at rdocadmin at mail.nih.gov if you have any particular burning questions you want answered. This webinar has been recorded and we'll be posting it on YouTube in case you, was, you wish to revisit some of the discussion today. So thank you again for your time, everyone. Um, thank, um, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.